I don't want no oil A spoil in my shoreline I like fish much better than crud I like birds and things A creeping and crawling Won't trade no more oil for blood The sun don't give us all we need To make this country run but that black demon oil's got us fussing and fighting And I do believe it's time we was done I don't want them nukes run by them kooks Who think radioactivity is fun No more three-headed frogs or kids with leukemia Nuclear power ain't fit for a dog The sun don't give us all we need To make this country run But that nuclear power's got us fussing and fighting And I do believe it's time we was done No news! Good morning, Toledo, and good afternoon, our wonderful Columbus and beautiful Bowling Green. And a big hello to everyone listening to our show on internet from wherever and whenever you may be. I'm your friend and host, Shabazz Khan, and I'm here with my terrific co-host, Rebecca Wood. And you, my dear listeners, have had the amazing good luck to tune into For a Green Future. This show, For a Green Future, is a show where we talk about ecology and the environment. And we talk about them in the ways they affect you and your health and wealth and happiness and the wealth and health and happiness of your friends and families and the students who are graduating this week and the birds that are busy nesting and feeding their little chicks and the insects the parents are feeding to those little chicks and pretty much everybody and everything because we are all wrapped up together on this crazy but beautiful little planet we call earth we have a great show lined up for you today we are going to talk for a few more minutes and you are most welcome and to call us at 877-909-1007 at any time we would love to hear from you on any ecological topic that you have questions about or you think people should hear about. Then we have a great guest lined up, Mr. Kevin Camps from Beyond Nuclear. We originally had a scheduled a guest from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. They called at the last minute and had to cancel because of some personal health problems. That's unfortunate because we were going to interview them about the latest failure at David Bess Davis Bessie nuclear plant. <laughs> yeah. Which they might otherwise not know about. They make their business to not know stuff. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, many of our listeners, uh, especially the long-time listeners, they might remember that uh, Davis Bessie once came within 3 sixteenths of an inch of having a catastrophic meltdown uh, like Fukushima which would have turned uh, Toledo, Detroit and Lake Erie into abandoned dead zones. Well, this latest uh, failure was not at that level, but it could be. You were saying something? Oh, no. I'm sorry. Okay. I, I thought you wanted to add something on, on this uh, Davis Bessie and the uh, catastrophic meltdown we had last I, I must have just looked like it. It's deceptive, the whole... Yeah, I just put that on so people don't realize my brain is completely vacant. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this latest failure was not at the level it could be, uh, but it turns out that Davis Bessie appears to be sinking. Uh, twice in the last six month, uh, months, last October and again in March, the pipes carrying water from for firefighting have ruptured and failed. The reasons the pipes failed is given as, and I quote, ground settling in typical uh -huh. NRC vagueness. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, 
the settling is only described as happening at uh, and i quote various locations around the planet plant sorry various locations around the plant uh, end quote uh, what what exactly does that mean so we were hoping to nail down this question in our interview uh, we are trying to work uh, to reschedule that interview once again let's see how that works out if that works out uh this latest failure is specially worrying for two reasons first if the plant really is sinking that could be potentially incredibly dangerous there are few things on earth as uh, heavy as loaded nuclear power plant davis bessie has been leaking radioactive tritium into the ground for years if that radioactive water leak is what has caused this subsidence the plant could be in real danger Mm-hmm. the second reason for the worry is that more and that is more definite reason and it sounds like more definite threat is that the nuclear plant kept running at full power without a functioning fire fighting system Lovely. that is very risky yeah. yeah if a fire had started in the plant while the fire fighting system was not functioning we could have had a disaster yeah so we will be watching this situation closely one rule of thumb for how serious a nuclear power plant breakdown is is how many inspectors the nrc sends to look over the problem in this case they are sending five inspectors that's a lot so the situation is definitely serious it's a five, five inspector problem <laughs> yeah so sending five inspectors that means they they need lots of brains to Uh, get into the details of it so we will we will have to wait and see how dangerous it is dangerous it is uh, uh, maybe kevin camps uh, from beyond nuclear he's an expert on the risks of nuclear power we and we are very grateful he was able to agree to be interviewed uh, at the last minute to fill in for the nrc so for the next few minutes uh, until mr kevin cramp uh calls we are going to look into the questions uh, what is so dangerous about radiation anyway uh, pro nuclear trolls are constantly dismissing fears of radiation even going so far as to say that radioactivity is actually good for you why do environmentalists worry about radiation so much that's what we'll talk for the next few minutes then we will chat with kevin we'll hear from our patrons our sponsors to whom we are incredibly grateful after that we will turn to rebecca for some words of wisdom on an environmental topic rebecca what will you be talking about this danny lions friend or foe wow <laughs> that's great looking forward to hear that so Very dramatic <laughs> yeah so after uh, hearing rebecca on danny lions we will be looking at the ecological news and we have some very intense news this week there are some incredible things happening right now that you'll want to know about that's it that's what we have planned for the next hour uh, as and and as i said at some point we hope to hear from you at 8779091007 i repeat 8779091007 so what's the big deal with the radiation anyways to hear the people pushing nuclear power right now it's nothing to worry about they talk about how natural radiation is uh, how it's in everything they talk about lots of uh, lots about bananas for some reasons now this also reminds me of microplastics how microplastics is also being found uh, into our water system our water cycle right. uh, the fish and sea life is consuming it and it's even the animals are consuming it and we are consuming the animals and eventually the microplastics are ending up in our blood streams our, our uh, uh, systems as well yeah the thing is like okay uh, mutation is a natural part of life and evolution and stuff but uh, not all mutations work out yeah. and sometimes yeah. they give you cancer instead of just giving your offspring some kind of advantageous 
trait. And, yeah. you know, you sometimes people just don't want children with several heads. So, yeah, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and I think we, we should cover on this topic later or, you know, in yeah. much detail as we had been uh, following up this story. Yeah. So coming back to our problem, the problem is not everything that's natural is good for you. Yes, there is naturally occurring radiation, but that that radiation causes naturally occurring cancers, mutations, and diseases. Increasing amount of radiation increases those problems. Smallpox is also natural, but when the U.S. government gave Native Americans blanket, blankets contaminated with smallpox, they were doing a great evil. So, to really understand how terrible radiation is, we have to travel outside of our solar, solar system. In fact, we have to follow all the way to the Voyager spacecraft. The Voyager spacecraft are now outside of something called the heliopause. The heliopause is a kind of force field. It's a magnetic bubble created by the sun's magnetic field. It turns out that our galaxy is full of radiation. That is, atomic particles like nuclei of hydrogen and atom Helium, at, helium atoms that have been sped up to nearly the speed of light by things like supernovas or black holes or collisions between stars. The heliopause stops 70% of that radiation. That's our first piece of incredible luck. Without the heliopause, intergalactic radiation would sterilize the Earth's surface. What radiation does to living cells is quite Simple. They tear them to pieces. A cell is an incredibly complicated and delicate piece of machinery. In a human cell, there are about 35,000 genes. Each of these genes has to work correctly in order for the cell to do its job in the body and keep us alive. What radiation does is blast those genes apart. External radiations like X-rays blast through the skin and smashes into the DNA that those genes are made from. DNA is made up of four acids, abbreviated as T, A, C and G. That These are sequenced in exact order. The damage radiation causes can take many forms. Whole genes can be knocked out. Sometimes only one of the amino acids is knocked out of place. Sometimes the chromosomes are broken. Sometimes, sequences are reversed. Pretty much any mistake you can imagine in a string of millions or so letters of A, G, T and C can be caused by radiation. Sometimes, this damage kills cells without, cells outright. Sometimes, this damage kills the cells outright. Sometimes, the mistakes cause the cells to develop into cancers or cause genetic diseases or shorten lifespans, or cause horrible defects and mutations. As we said, this can be caused by external radiation like cosmic rays or X-rays. It can also be caused by radiation that is absorbed internally. But we are getting ahead of ourselves here. Let's go back out into space. So, the heliopause blocks 70% of the intergalactic radiation. But zooming in, Towards the Earth, we find another magnetic field, the Earth's magnetic field, that, pr that protects us from ev even more radiation. While the Sun protects us, it also fires radiation of all kinds at us. Like the heliosphere, the Earth's magnetic field or magnetosphere blocks most of the radiation that the Sun throws at us. And most of us get what gets past the helios heliosphere. Next, we come to Earth's atmosphere that blocks most of the radiation that gets past the magnetosphere. The ozone layer, in particular, blocks most of the ultraviolet radiation that sun shoots at us. Without the ozone layer, the surface of Earth would be sterilized. But now, we are actually going to go below the surface of the Earth. The planet beneath our feet is also filled with radiation. Radio radioactive elements like uranium, radium and radon are constantly shooting off radioactive particles. Most geologists believe that these radioactive isotopes 
keep the earth's core and mantle heated and molten now we can talk about radio isotopes or radio active isotopes when the nucleus of an atom has too many neutrons it is unstable for example tritium is a hydrogen atom that has one proton and two neutrons the binding energy inside the nucleus is not strong enough to hold the arrange arrangement together so eventually the nucleus explodes when it explodes it shoots off the extra neutron into the environment chemically a tritium atom is exactly the same as a regular stable hydrogen atom the body absorbs tritium because it forms water molecules just like regular hydrogen h2o but what happens is at some unpredictable point when the nucleus explodes it shoots off that extra neutron in the form of radiation just like external radiation the internal radiation from radioactive atoms also causes cancers diseases and mutations in fact internal radiation is worse because the living cells aren't protected by your skin so we have radiation above us trying to trying to get at us from the galaxy and sun we have radiation from below us in the form of natural radio isotopes under the earth where we live the biosphere is a razor thin protected haven from radiation in fact if the earth were the size of a basketball the radiation protected layer where living things can survive would be about 1/10 the thickness of a piece of paper what nuclear what nuclear plants and nuclear bombs do is fill that incredibly thin slice of life with destructive radiation every second a nuclear plant operates it creates over 200 different kinds of radioactive isotopes each can be absorbed by the body in different ways all of them are deadly the more radiation the less life it's a sim- it's as simple as that we are already we already have sitting in spent fuel pools at nuclear plants around the world enough radiation to turn the earth into a dead zone like mars in fact one of the ways the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs killed everything was depositing a layer, layer of radioactive americium all over the globe taking the one property of earth that makes life possible its protection from radiation and filling that with radiation is insane So it's a little bit like uh, when you say that the the algae in Lake Erie pr- or algal blooms are algal blooms are a problem because they really produce excessive nutrients. Mm-hmm. There's already enough nutrients. You know that yeah. nature does not need more, more nutrients, nutrients from yeah. us. Too much is not good. So when we are now we are talking about insanity, and when you are dealing with insanity, it's always best to find an expert. So our guest today is Kevin Camps. He has been fighting the nuclear industry. For many years, so let's say a big hello to Kevin Camps. Hello, Kevin, are you hello. there? Hi, yeah, I'm here. Thank you so much for being here on such a short notice. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you for joining us on our show for a green future. So Glad to be here. Thank you. So to start, uh, we, so let's start with you telling about. telling the people more about yourself and more about your position uh, so the people uh, our listeners get to know more about you sure yeah um i work at beyond nuclear which is a national watchdog on the nuclear industry we're based in tacoma park maryland close to washington dc and my job is radioactive waste specialist so that's my focus is the radioactive waste but I'm also on the board of Don't Waste Michigan. I'm from Kalamazoo, Michigan, and so I do keep involved with reactor issues in the Great Lakes region, including at Davis Bessie, Ohio. So, before we talk about the recent problems at uh, David Davis Bessie, let's review some of the other nuclear issues we have been following on this show for a green future. First off, uh, what is the status of the plan the evil company Holtec has arrived uh, to to revive the dead uh, palisades nuclear power plant 
and uh, maybe you can start with a quick review of what's been happening over there. Sure, yeah. Holtec International is kind of a, a growing nuclear company in the United States and even internationally, unfortunately, because it's a very crooked company. It engages in activities like bribery. It's also incompetent or worse at what it does. Mostly, it began as a radioactive waste container storage company, and it has now grown into a decommissioning company, which means when a nuclear power plant shuts down permanently, it will dismantle the facility, it will clean up the radioactive contamination, it will manage the high-level radioactive waste. That's what it's supposed to be doing. What it's really doing, unfortunately, is pocketing as much money as it can while doing as little of those activities as I described as it can get away with. So at Palisades in Michigan uh, last June, June 28th, Holtec took over from the previous owner, Entergy. Entergy had permanently closed the Palisades Atomic Reactor on the Lake Michigan shoreline on May 20th after more than 50 years of operations. It was the, the newest owner. There was a previous owner even before that. And here comes Holtec saying that it's going to decommission Palisades when, in fact, it was a bait-and-switch. So we learned later um, in September of 2022 that just a week or so after taking over at Palisades, Holtec applied to the U.S. Department of Energy for a bailout of $1.2 billion. Wow. And its actual plan is to restart Palisades. And that's never been done in U.S. history and perhaps around the world that a nuclear plant would shut down and then be returned to operations. Hmm. So right now we find ourselves embroiled um, not in a celebration of Palisades closure, thank goodness, because it's such a dangerous reactor, and a celebration of the fact that no more radioactive waste would be generated there, and a focus instead on trying to clean up the radioactive mess that's been made for the past 50 years on that site. Instead, what we're looking at is a very dangerous situation, not only to taxpayer pocketbooks at the federal and state level, because Holtec is seeking more than $10 billion in public money, most of it just at Palisades, to restart the old reactor, to build multiple brand new small modular reactors on the site, but also a threat to public health and safety and the environment, as well as security. Because what we're talking about here is the, the extremes of risk with nuclear power. You would have a 50-plus-year-old atomic reactor that is extremely dangerous, never more dangerous than if they were to restart it. Plus, they're talking about building new, what they call small modular reactors on the site. So you've got the risk extremes of age-degraded de age old reactor and then brand new reactors that have never even been tested, let alone operated. And just remember from history that new reactors can have big disasters. Chernobyl was a year old when it had its disaster. Three Mile Island Unit 2 was a year old. It had only operated really for three months when it had its disaster. Uh, Fermi Unit 1, we almost lost Detroit in Michigan, was a brand new reactor, and it was small as well. So small reactors can have big disasters, and the list really keeps going. So that's what Holtec is up to at Palisades in Michigan as we speak. My God, that's a very scary situation. I, I just want to quickly mention here that one of the reasons we call Holtec evil because of its plan to dump millions of gallons of radio, radioactive water into the Hudson River in New York and, and Plymouth Bay in Mass Massachusetts. Uh, there, at least it seems like resistance has mobilized and is having some effect. Uh, can you provide some latest information from there? Yeah, I'm really inspired um, by the efforts of the grassroots and even elected officials in places like Plymouth, Massachusetts at Cape Cod Bay. That's called the Pilgrim Nuclear Power Plant, as well as at Indian Point Nuclear Power Plant upstream on the Hudson from New York City. In both cases, the anti-nuclear movement at the grassroots has activated even some pretty high level government officials. So in the case of New York, you've got the Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and the other U.S. Senator, Kirsten Gillibrand, who have spoken out and called for more information from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, why it would be okay 
for Holtec, which, you know, specializes in taking over dead reactors, to now dump specifically the high-level radioactive waste wet pool storage water into the Hudson River, which is radioactively contaminated. Unfortunately, in the New York case, um, the New York Times just a day or two ago put out a um, editorial that said, oh, it's fine. Just dump it in the river, which is insane, like you're right. saying. Yeah. And up in Massachusetts, um, the folks up there have succeeded in getting not only the governor of the state, who used to be the attorney general, but even the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency to say, hold on a second here. We can't approve you dumping this radioactive wastewater into Cape Cod Bay because it's already an endangered ecosystem. And there are endangered species like whales who at least migrate through there, if not spend some time there. And I would hasten to add that we're facing the same risk at Palisades in Michigan. Holtec wants to dump a million gallons of radioactive wastewater into Lake Michigan. So we really have a lot of work to do to try to match what our colleagues are doing in New York and Massachusetts I think to this, try to stop that. I think this situation demands all our attention. Okay, moving forward, I, the next question is, like, uh, Holtec has said that it has agreed to wait on dumping into the Hudson because they want time to educate people. They want some time to educate the public. So uh, does it seem that there is an incre incredible media blitz going on right now trying to convince the public that radiation is safe and nuclear power is a good idea? Even like Oliver, Oliver Stone has drunk the radioactive Kool-Aid coming out with a pro-nuclear pro propaganda movie. Can you give us an idea on how much of this costing is, how this promotion is done, and the this, this sheer volume of uh, propaganda people are being exposed to? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the pro-nuclear propaganda really ebbs and flows over time. I mean, we've seen, you know, swells of pro-nuclear propaganda at various points through the decades. I've been doing this for more than 30 years, and it comes and then it goes down a little bit. But this time, instead of an ebb or a flow, it's more like a tsunami. I think that the nuclear power industry sees an opportunity to really um, get some money from the federal government. And in fact, they have gotten authorization for huge bailouts and loans, like in the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, the Nuclear Information and Resource Service has analyzed the Inflation Reduction Act and in fact, led a coalition effort to try to stop this from happening, but um, unfortunately was not able to stop it. I mean, we're not talking tens of billions of dollars. We're talking hundreds of billions of dollars right. in the Inflation Reduction Act that is earmarked for the nuclear power industry. So we really have a fight on our hands now. And uh, unfortunately, the nuclear power industry, with all of these public subsidies, this would just be the latest. I mean, they've enjoyed this kind of support from the federal government, from state governments, from the military, we're, we're talking from the beginning, we're talking from the 1950s here. Because of its close relationship with nuclear weapons, that's kind of why. But um, so a part of that, you know, filthy wealth that they have that they don't deserve is the fact that they have bottomless resources to do propaganda, like you're saying, and boy, do they ever. So here we go again. And unfortunately, they get help from <laughs> People like Oliver Stone, who really should know better, uh, but unfortunately are are doing the bidding of this, uh, you know, dangerous uh, industry. So we fight back as best we can. Um, there are some great anti-nuclear documentaries out there that I hope people can take a look at. Um, one that I just got to see again is an MSNBC documentary called uh, In the Shadow of the Valley. It's about a nuclear meltdown in Southern California that was kept secret for more than 20 years. It's called the Santa Susana Field Laboratory. And uh, interestingly and very relevantly, one of the lead reactor designs for these so-called new build small modular reactors is sodium cooled um, liquid sodium metal, which is exactly what happened at Fermi Unit 1 with the meltdown there. We almost lost Detroit in 1966. So in 1959, near Los Angeles, there was a meltdown in one of these prototype reactors. 
And what the film focuses on is uh, the health consequences of that for people right up to today. So, you know, it focuses on families in this area whose children are suffering from very rare cancers. There shouldn't be one of these cancers in the community, and there are multiple of these cancers in the community. So it's an inspiring and, you know, heart-rending story about families trying to defend themselves and everyone else from what they now know is a radioactive monster that lives in their midst. Hey, my God. Uh, a quick shout-out to all the listeners about the NB, N, N, MSNBC documentary you sent. Yeah, it was produced, it was supported by um, MSNBC. It came out a couple years ago, but we just had a showing in Washington, D.C. at the headquarters of Natural Resources Defense Council mm -hmm. just a few days ago as part of our annual D.C. Days of the Alliance for Nuclear Accountability. So I just happened to see that one recently, but there are other great films. I mean, there's a new one that just came out a month ago called Radioactive, The Women of Three Mile Island that was produced by... Heidi Hutner, and um, we it's talked also to that lady. <laughs> just a, a tour de force. So if we if we see that there is a pattern for the last 50 years or so, uh, is that like there is uh, nuclear power plants they gain they gain pop popularity, then there is some uh, horrible accident, uh, then people come to their senses for a decade or so, but after a decade, the pro-nuclear advertisings and promotions by the government and nuclear industry kicks in and people forget about the accidents and nukes uh, becoming more popular again until the next uh, accident ha uh, happens. So this is kind of a, uh, a cyclic system uh, uh, repeating. So this latest problem with Davis Bessie may not uh, approach that level of meltdown like, like Fukushima, but Uh, does it seem fairly serious enough? Yes. Um, so the latest news at Davis Bessey that just came out within the last week, I believe, is that there is ground settling at the site, which means perhaps because the weight of the facility, and these are massive facilities, the containment building, the shield building, even perhaps the cooling towers are very heavy artificial objects. And I think it might be the fact that it's right on the Lake Erie shoreline on what used to be wetland. So perhaps the foundations are beginning to fail to some extent. And it is very significant because Davis Bessey has all kinds of problems already. I mean, specifically what the Nuclear Regulatory Commission announcement focused on was the failure of fire protection systems because the piping is being so stressed by this land settling, as they call it. And I have to wonder why we had to wait, um, boy, six months to hear about this since the problem was discovered supposedly six months ago. So they take their sweet time to let the public know anything is going on. But you have to look at the bigger context of Davis Bessey. One problem that we've known about since October of 2011 is that the shield building, the final line of defense on the containment structure at Davis Bessey, has been severely cracked since even according to the companies, since 1978, they, they're claiming that the blizzard of 1978 is what cracked the shield building. So here we have a severely cracked containment that is now settling, apparently. Um, I have to assume that the land settling does involve the shield building. It's the heaviest object at the site. And the question is, is this going to be the small additional load that even the Nuclear Regulatory Commission a dozen, years ago, a dozen years ago said could be the failure mechanism of the shield building, which means spalling of massive chunks of concrete off the exterior face, which could take out safety systems down below, which could cause the meltdown in the reactor and then fail to contain the hazardous radioactivity from spewing out into the environment. That's what's really incredible. And yet they insist on operating Davis Bessey which should have shut down on Earth Day 2017. That was the 40-year license expiration. And we fought the 20-year license renewal with everything we had, and we're told to go jump in a Great Lake by the company, by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. When they have all of these problems and this horrible history at Davis Bessey, more near misses with catastrophe than maybe any other reactor in the country, and they just want to play radioactive Russian roulette in northwest ohio they seem uh intent on doing that oh my god 
Kevin, I mean, there is lots of information uh, going around here we need to unpack. So before we, we, before I ask you a couple of more questions on David, Davis Bessie, please, can you, can you summarize like uh, all the information, unpack us uh, all the information, what we have un, uh, until now, what we have so far? Um, I guess I would just point out that this land settling problem is what led to the cancellation of an atomic complex in Michigan called the Midland Nuclear Power Plant near Saginaw, near Midland, in Midland, Michigan, back in the 1980s. Um, the plant was one of the units, there were two reactors being built, was nearly 90% completed. The other one more like 50% completed. And the entire project was canceled at a loss of billions of dollars to shareholders and likely also ratepayers because of this leaning tower of PISA phenomenon where the foundations were badly built and the nuclear plant was sinking into the earth and it was affecting safety significant systems. Mm -hmm. Well, if the Midland nuclear power plant can be canceled before it's even fired up in the first place because of this problem, you have to wonder why shouldn't a 50 year old atomic reactor on the shore of Lake Erie uh, also be retired before the worst happens. And yet there's no plans to retire it. Even in the NRC's press release, they said, oh, we've ensured safety. And, you know, truth be told to your audience, I mean, the reactor could be on fire, spewing radioactivity into the environment at Chernobyl levels, and the NRC would still say everything's fine. That's what this agency is like. And in fact, you know, the fire suppression systems being damaged by this problem is very significant because 50% of the risk, half of the risk of an atomic meltdown is associated with fires. The other 50% would be all other causes of a meltdown. Fire is a very significant risk factor at a nuclear plant, and they've admitted that their fire protection systems are damaged. Okay. So if you say Davis Bessie was running for a full-time power without uh, any effective firefighting system, so do you think are there uh, ever fires at nuclear plants? How big risk uh, uh, were they taking by keeping the plant at full power? Fire is a huge risk at nuclear power plants. There was a, a near miss in Alabama at the Browns Ferry Nuclear Power Plant in 1975, which in fact kept the unit that was involved offline for decades. They finally did bring it back, but it took decades to bring it back. So that was a near miss involving fire. And uh, there have been other examples. Uh, the Fort Calhoun nuclear power plant in Nebraska was permanently shut down in the aftermath of a fire that took place there. So fire is a very significant risk factor at atomic reactors. That's why sophisticated fire protection um, systems are required to be deployed on site. And here at Davis Bessey, they've admitted that multiple aspects of fire protection have been compromised in the last six months or more by this problem. Okay. And as you mentioned earlier uh, about ground settling, the NRC is saying that the problem is caused by ground settling. Is it normal for a plant this old to be settling this much? What do you think might be going on here? No, I don't think it's normal. Um, I think that, you, like I said, the weight of the facilities is a factor, but I think another factor is probably just the, the wetland that they built it on. I mean, they built it in the middle of a bird sanctuary on a wetland. They tried to drain it, um, but of course, water will find its way back. We will certainly try to keep eye on this situation. So before we, we move on, uh, would you like to add anything to, to the information for our listeners uh, and viewers worldwide? Uh, and also, uh, yeah, I um, also wanted to know about you mentioned bait and switch. So, Yeah, I guess just to summarize, I mean, I don't want to be Debbie Downer from Saturday Night Live. Um, <laughs> at a time like this where problems are being revealed, even by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which has kept it secret for six months, by the way, this is a good, a, a good time for folks to jump in, get active, because these are our opportunities to get somewhere. Um, you know, there are so many problems at Davis Bessey that we, you know, if we work hard enough, we may be able to shut it down. I mean, all of this comes in the aftermath 
of the biggest bribery scandal in Ohio history, which is really saying something, where First Energy Nuclear tried to bribe, did bribe the state government for a billion dollar bailout and they got caught. So if enough people get involved and demand from elected officials that justice be served, one would hope that before the worst happens at Davis Bessie that perhaps we can force its retirement. And we face the same situation at Palisades and the other reactors that we've mentioned thus far. Um, People power is the only way we're going to prevent the worst from happening at these atomic reactors. And the bait and switch part and the cover up that we've talked about, just realize we're being lied to constantly by this industry and even by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So folks just need to see through the lies see through the propaganda, get active, share this info with your friends, and try to have fun while saving the planet and and while saving ourselves. Uh, Thank you very much, Kevin. But before we go, please uh, give us, give our listeners your contact details and tell us about Beyond Nuclear. Yeah, um, please do check out our website. It is beyondnuclear.org. Another good website is NEARS.org. NEARS is short for Nuclear Information and Resource Service. And from those websites, you can find all kinds of information as well as, you know, links to other organizations near you. And uh, if folks want to contact me directly, just send me an email. That's the best way. It's Kevin at BeyondNuclear.org. Thank you very much once again, Kevin. And you have a wonderful day. Great. Weekend ahead. You Thank too. You. Good talking. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye. Okay. That brings to the end of uh, one of our favorite parts of the show. Uh, so let's hear from our advertisers and patrons. The EcoPill shop is located at 115 West Mary in Bowling Green, Ohio. They sell lots of different things. Cosmetics, bath and body, home and garden, cleaning, towels, knickknacks, candles, fragrances, and more. They sell all of these things without plastic containers. The whole purpose of the EcoPhil shop is to eliminate plastic. Customers love them. Summer says, I'm loving the products they offer. It's sensible and affordable, all while being eco-friendly and plant-based, eliminating the unnecessary use of chemicals. That's just one of the glowing testimonials you'll see at their website, ecophilshops.com. Corinne says one of her favorite products is the dish soap. She can't believe how easy the stains come out. If you're interested, give them a call at 419-944-8862 and talk to the owner, Josie, who's very passionate about environmental issues. Or you can check out their website, ecofillshop.com. Or, best yet, you can drop in at 115 West Mary in Bowling Green. That's the Ecofill Shop. For a Green Future is also brought to you by the Wood County Park District. The Wood County Park District is a natural resources conservation agency. They protect natural spaces, maintain quality green spaces, provide engaging programming, and they teach people to love and respect nature. They also restore wildlife habitats and lead people on outdoor adventures. Wood County Parks protects natural spaces in Wood County for all to enjoy from 8 a.m. to 30 minutes past sunset every day of the year. There are several ways to get a hold of them and find out what's happening. One is to call them at 419-353-1897. Another is to visit their website, www.wcparks.org. The website, again, is at www.wcparks.org. They are also available on all social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and many others. Just search for WC Parks. That's the Wood County Park District, and we're very grateful for their support. Welcome back. For this this show, For a Green Future, is also brought to you by our patrons. Our patrons are wonderful people who gave, who have gone to the patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com. They searched for our page, For a Green Future. Up popped our Patreon page with some cool pictures and listening different monthly and they uh, selected different monthly patronage levels. Uh, People can set their own uh, levels to match their personal budget. Uh, Now a monthly donation comes out of their accounts and comes over to us. And that's how we can afford to keep our program on air 
and bring you incredible information that no one else is covering so we move ahead with our uh, incredible host rebecca's show Alrighty, so uh, an alert listener a, a couple of weeks ago, actually, but I had other stuff to do, sent me in an article from the uh, Youngstown weather site from 420-2023, which I thought I would go into about dandelions. Uh, according to this article, and I think other sources as well, dandelions are perennials. Uh, they you, you don't got to replant them. <laughs> they replant themselves. <laughs> um, they thrive in many soil conditions. Uh, they're they're highly freeze and frost resistant. To some degree, also drought and heat resistant, although not as much. Got a deep root root structure, which helps with the drought and also with other plants' competition. Uh, they're called their name means lion's tooth, or in Latin, lindodon. Taraxicum was just passing by. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, other names they have are bitterwort, blowball, uh, clockflower, cankerwort, Irish daisy, priest crown, swine snout, and tell time. At least a couple of those seem to be related to the fact that they uh, they they sort of they uh, they move around with the sun a little. I think they mm, open and close like depending on yeah. So and uh, wort. That's interesting because I know they're used for medicinal purposes, and uh, uh, a lot of times things called wort are uh, canker wort implies that they might cure cankers. Also, I've heard inflammation. I don't know if that's true. Uh, they're probably from Eurasia, but they've now moved to all parts of the northern hemisphere. So they've been invasive from way back. <laughs> My God, <laughs> almost like people. Um, they're they're good because they're a source of pollen and nectar for butterflies, bees, moss, beetles, especially bumblebee queens in the early spring when they're just founding a colony and, and need a lot of high quality food. Also, the, I did not know this. Seeds are eaten by finches and sparrows, so that's nice. Also, according to the Columbus Daily the Daily Tribune, they've been. In a, I you know I wanted to find out are they invasive or are they not? Uh, sort of. <laughs> they've they are invasive, but they've been in America so long that they're not sort of not invasive anymore you know whatever they replaced is long gone and uh the bees need them we cannot afford to most of our bees are invasive too and we can't afford to lose any at this point we seriously cannot uh they were brought by colonists for medicinal purposes originally they do not threaten native species according to this um in the 1800s crazily enough people were pulling out grass to let the dandelions grow and that was actually a better idea than what we do now probably um yeah the bee population has decreased sharply in the past 15 years so we just need to do everything we can for the bees uh and they're the first flowers to sprout in the spring on mass so there's a lot of it it's a really good food source uh, if you are going to get rid of them, dig them up. Do not uh, put pesticides on them because that will harm the bees that eat off of them. Okay. Thank you very much, Rebecca, for this wonderful information. You're a quick welcome. thank you to all our patrons and sponsors. We are running out of time, so I will quickly jump on to the ecological news. First news is a report from Le Monde on, uh, on April 21st titled Ukraine Wants Recognition and Repartitions from Russian ecocide most of us know that as the war unfolds ukraine is carefully documenting the war cri- war crimes and atrocities russia is committing with the plan to hold russia accountable for the after the conflict ends on a parallel track ukraine is also documenting documenting the ecological damage russia is doing war is dirty when russia bombs an industrial site toxic pollution gets spread over a wide area there are Heavy metals in the munitions and the rocket fuels used in the missiles is also highly toxic. The fighting has destroyed nature preserves like the Black Sea Bio Preserve, uh, Bio Reserve, which is the largest wetland in Ukraine and identified as the wetland of international importance. That burned last year in a fire that was visible from space. Farm fields are contaminated, threatening future food supplies. Even the ocean is being affected. The Nature Conservation, Conservation Agency, UA Animal, Animals, estimates that 50,000 whales and dolphins were killed in the Black, Black Sea last year. That is about, that is about one-fifth of the entire population. Greenpeace and the Ukrainian NGO EcoAction Eco have created an interactive map showing over 900 900 places Russia has damaged with 
damaged the Ukrainian ecosystems in this war so far. However, on a side note, Britain has sent depleted uranium munitions to the Ukraine. While these radioactive shells are very effective at blowing up tanks, they contaminate the land around the battlefield with highly toxic uranium. In places where depleted uranium has been used, like Iraq, the number of miscarriages and birth defects more than quadruples. At the start of the show, we were talking about how radiation affects living organisms. Well, the child developing the developing in the mother's womb is the most sensitive to radiation damage. Radiation damages rapidly divide cells more than other cells because or a dividing cell has its DNA all spread out in order to be copied rather than clumped together in a tight ball in the nucleus. Second story. Uh, some good news. Renew Economy uh, uh, Renew Economy has a story published on April 24th titled Solar is a Runaway Global Success and Australia is Showing the Way Forward. According to the article, solar and wind power are being installed around the world three times faster than all the other energy sources combined. This includes hydro, coal, gas and nuclear. Unfortunately, many countries, especially China, are continuing to install new coal plants, but they are installing wind and solar much faster. Per person, the top five countries installing wind, solar and hydropower are Netherlands, Sweden, Australia, Norway and Finland. The US ranks 19th in clean energy installations. So, a related story in The Guardian dated April 27th documents that renewable energy surge has driven electricity prices in Australia to record lows. In the first quarter 2023, wholesale electricity prices dropped 10% from December 2022 down to $1.83 per megawatt hour. So this was the second news. Uh, let me quickly jump to the third news. Uh, unfortunately, uh, for our next story, we did return to Ohio. According to the April 24th story by Channel 21 News, WFMJ in Youngstown, Vienna Township has banned commercial solar farms. The Turnbull County, uh, County Townships joins four other townships in neighboring Columbiana County that have already banned solar. And there are eight more townships considering similar bans. Vienna. Vienna, yeah. So you might be you might be wondering why on earth uh, townships would be banning solar. Now, well, the excuses are many. Clear. Uh, glare from panels affecting the airplane pilots is one of the more far-fetched excuses. Trustees are also claiming to be worried that panels uh, panels will only last 30 years and then they are afraid the taxpayers will be charged with dismantling them. The problem is easily dealt with uh, though by requiring decommissioning de bonds. That is very common in the wind industry. What we believe uh, is, is actually happening here is these countries are actually politically controlled by fracking industry. Mm. Wells have been polluted. People living near fracking installations are complaining of high rates of uh, many diseases. But the township leadership is not concerned about the actual damage the, uh, the fracking is ca causing to the citizens. The Vienna also limits uh, rooftop solar installations to a tiny 50 square feet. Not large enough to provide enough, even half the electricity a typical household needs. And it imposes other restrictions that make rooftop solar impossible and impractical. So that's going to be it, my dear friends. Uh, we hope to see you uh, next Sunday. Keep listening, keep tuned into For a Green Future. Have a good bye. Any bye bye. <laughs> But that black 
demon oils got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done.